So we have our three phases, and let's take a look at how these three phases lay out in terms of the birthing process. So the last thing to look at here is the response as it relates to breastfeeding. Now breastfeeding is going to, in terms of the physiological and anatomic responses, will occur during uh, pregnancy with increased levels of prolactin and uh, estrogen. However, the overall response is going to be masked until very late in pregnancy due to high levels of circulating pro uh, progesterone. Part of the response that we're going to see within breastfeeding is going to be a reconstitution and a reinstitution of growth hormone as well as a normalization of activity within the cerebral cortex, leading to a reduction of stress and anxiety and an overall reduction of what's sometimes referred to as post postpartal depression, which can become problematic and troublesome for both the mother as well as the neonate. So during pregnancy, what ends up happening is we're going to start seeing a change of signals from GnRH, GHRH, and PRH. What's up happening is we're going to start seeing increasing levels of FSH, which is going to stimulate ovaries to start to release estrogen. We'll start seeing a little bit of growth hormone. However, most of what we're going to start seeing is prolactin. Estrogen and prolactin will go into circulation. What they're going to do is they're going to induce hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the mammary gland itself, and they're going to increase adipose depositing around the gland to protect the developing gland. So this leads to an engorged and enlarged mammary. We're going to see increase of luminal epithelium. We're going to see increased volume of the luminal epithelium itself from prolactin from progesterone. However, we're not going to see any ejection of milk as progesterone is excessively high and oxytocin is excessively low. That's going to change as we go through the pregnancy and then into the suckling phases postnatally. Now in terms of development, what is up happening is we'll start seeing increases of the lobular cells themselves and increasing amounts of lobes. We'll start seeing more luminal epithelial cells that will be able to produce the milk during lactation and we'll start seeing increases of myoepithelial cells around the luminal cells that will help with the ejection of milk upon exposure to oxytocin. 
Now, as we go through pregnancy, what ends up happening is that we're going to start seeing increases of estrogen and prolactin and slow reduction of progesterone with increasing levels of oxytocin. This increasing level of oxytocin with reduction of progesterone is going to start to increase the responsiveness to the myoepithelium, inducing the, re the ejection of milk from the mammary glands. So what ends up happening is that there are distinct signals that are going to come into play here. We can have cognitive input from the crying of the baby, or we can have actual physical stimulation around the aerial and the nipple of the breast. This is going to increase oxytocin release from the posterior pituitary. This is going to cause contraction of the myoepithelium, the muscle around the ducts within the mammary gland, but it's also going to start changing cortical structures within the prefrontal cortex and within the limbic system, leading to attachments with the child leading to an overall change of the brain anatomy, which is sometimes referred to as maternal brain. We're going to start seeing ejection of the milk from the mammary gland. This ejection was going to initiate additional suckling, which is going to initiate additional response from the infant, leading to additional stimulus on the aerial and the nipple. All of this is done in a positive feedback until either the crying stops or until stimulation around the breast, the nipple itself, stops. So what happens in terms of the feedback loop? Now, all of this is dependent upon normal dopamine and normal serotonin levels regulating prolactin-releasing hormone. So we start getting this cortical input. This cortical input is going to supplement the GHRH signals as well as the FSH signals, in which we're going to have prolactin being released as well as converting enzymes, converting growth hormone into prolactin. Increasing levels of estrogen and prolactin is going to cause additional maintenance of the uh, epithelial cells. As we start having the signals of crying from the infant or stimulation around the nipple, we're going to start to increase the circulating levels of oxytocin. The circulating levels of oxytocin is going to stimulate the myoepithelium to contract around the ducts, leading to ejection of the milk. At the same time, this oxytocin is going to feed positively back onto the cortical areas, leading to additional cortical structural changes and changing levels of stress, leading to elevations of beta endorphins and normalizing levels of dopamine and serotonin. So let's take a look at the benefits of breastfeeding for both the infant as well as for the mom. For the infant, it's going to start the immune response. We're going to get antibodies transmitted from the mom. We're going to initiate development of acquired immunity via IgA. We're going to start having the high caloric demand that is needed met. We're going to start having the high nutrient demand that is needed met. There's a large amount of musculoskeletal response that's taking place within the infant. There's a large amount of nervous system adaptation that's taking place. We get a huge amount of plasticity within the neurological system as well as within the cerebral cortex. We get a high amount of plasticity taking place within the musculoskeletal system as it's learning how to adapt to this new environment. But more importantly, there is a change of psychological well-being for both the child as well as the mom. This change in psychological well-being is shown with a reduction of stress levels and stress hormones, an increase of oxytocin levels, and a change of beta endorphin and POMC secretions within the thalamus and hypothalamus. This changes lead to uh, bonding moments between the mother and the child and can actually lead to long-term neuroanatomical changes for both the mom and the infant. For the mom, we get a reinstitution of growth hormone production and release. We get a balancing of emotional state. We get a change of brainwave patterning towards a state of relaxation. We get alterations of the reticular activating system as well as the dopamine, noradrenergic, and serotonergic pathways. We get a reduction of pregnancy weight. This reduction of pregnancy weight is predominantly fluids, not a loss of actual fat-free mass. 
we can see a reduction of fat mass. However, the reduction of fat mass is not because fat mass is going into the lactations. It's because of the high caloric demand that is taking place to the mom and the high nutrient demand that is taking place within the mom to meet metabolic demands post-birth. There are a couple other really interesting additional benefits that can come about due that reduce relative risk for diseases for the child. There's a reduced relative risk for metabolic issues and diabetes. There's a reduced relative risk for obesity as well as for communicable diseases. There's a reduced relative risk for non-communicable diseases related to obesity and metabolic issues. There's a reduced relative risk for food allergies, particularly if the mother is consuming a variety of foods as Every food particle that the mother is consuming has a chance of being seen within the breast milk. For the mother, there's a reduced relative risk for estrogen-derived breast cancers, as well as a reconstitution of normal rhythmic regulations for both reproductive hormones as well as non-reproductive hormones. Now, what's interesting in terms of this reduced risk for breast cancer is that they've done studies with uh, families where they've had the genetic uh, determinants for breast cancer within the families where they've noted that females who breastfed had lower rates of cancerous growth relative to females who did not breastfeed. And it appears to be related to the regulations of receptors and downstream modifications from that receptor regulation within the breastfeeding female versus the non-breastfeeding female. 